Good evening. I want to thank you for the comments from the lesson this morning. Um, you know, as a preacher, you wrestle with a topic or with a sermon, not just the whole week, but sometimes the whole month leading up to it. You over and over again as you play it out and how you're going to say things and what you're going to say, wonder, is this the best way? Is that the best way? You pray for God to give you guidance and, and how you say it. And so um, you, know, you go back and then you wrestle with it afterwards and you wonder, okay, did it come out right? And so I appreciate all the, all the comments and affirmation this morning. You know, just to kind of put a, a bow on it, what we were trying to get across this morning is that traditions aren't necessarily bad. They're just not God. And traditions are not on equal standing with God's Word, and we have to understand that. We understand that traditions have a rightful place, and there are many good traditions that uh, really were born out of the generation before us, or maybe even many generations before us, and the only reason we can criticize them is because somebody stepped up and said, I'm going to do something. And so that can be a good thing. And our, our traditions must never invalidate the Word of God, and that's why I talked this morning about, you know, the ending a prayer in Jesus' name, and, you know, I wrestled with even whether to bring that up or not, because, you know, I realize that's a kind of a dicey subject with people. I mean, obviously, you know, John 14, 13 and 14, Jesus talks about, you know, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, and so that, that is something that's rooted in Scripture. It's, was that meant for us to close every prayer within Jesus' name for all time? I don't know, but I mean, obviously, it's a good thing to do, um, but do we understand why we do it? That was the point. Do we understand why we do it? Do we understand why we pray in Jesus' name? Or do we invalidate the Word of God because we just treat it as a formality or as an addendum? And so, you know, I appreciate what you said this morning and your comments, and, and you guys are so good to me. And I just wanted to put a bow on that and let you know that, you know, we have many good traditions. We have many bad traditions that have gone by the wayside, thankfully. But a tradition is simply a tradition, and they evolve over time, and we need to recognize that and understand their place. And uh, I think Jesus was saying it's not just your traditions, it's your approach to them. How do you handle them? What kind of place do they occupy in your life? Tonight, we're talking about an equally difficult subject. We're talking about divorce. If you came tonight expecting me to give you every scenario which constitutes a valid divorce or marriage or remarriage, that's not going to happen tonight. We're talking about transitions, and we're talking about a transition from married life to divorce, because what is ideal and what is real are often two different things, right? I mean, they just are. What God is joined together, let no man separate. That is the ideal, but you know as well as I do that people get divorced, and people come into our churches divorced. People in our churches get divorced. How do we deal with that? How do we approach that? You know, it reminds me of a story about a, a man and a woman. The wife asked him one night, she said, uh, if I die, would you remarry? And he said, yeah, absolutely. I mean, didn't even hesitate. Well, this kind of irritated her. And she said, well, would you live in this, this same house? And he said, yeah, probably. She was getting more and more upset by the minute. She said, well, would you let her wear my jewelry? Yeah, probably. Would you let her drive my car? Yeah, probably. Would you give her my golf clubs? He said, no, she's left-handed. <laughs> Yikes. That would be a lot funnier if it wasn't true, right? But so many people enter into the covenant of marriage with so much joy and so much hope of that till death do us part. And yet they end up in court, cruel and caustic. Marriage is kind of like flies on a screen door, 50% one in and 50% one out. And that's a truly a shame. And you've heard me say before, it's not so much that the divorce rate is high in our culture. It's the, pr the problem is people are entering into marriage not knowing what the divine architect has had to say about it. Never consulting the divine blueprint. So many people are entering into marriage without ever even considering what God has said about it. Marriage is a covenant. Covenants are serious. You don't enter into covenants lightly. And you certainly don't break them lightly either. You know, this is a, a great challenge. 
preaching on the topic of divorce. Because you can approach this topic from several different angles. I could encourage those who have divorced for what may be deemed an unscriptural reason. I, I don't like those terms, by the way. Scriptural versus unscriptural divorce or marriage or whatever. But I could, I could encourage those who have divorced for what we might deem an unscriptural reason or those who are unscripturally married to repent and receive God's forgiveness. Or I could take a more theological approach and try to explain all the grounds for divorce and remarriage. Or I could go through and try to give you every unique scenario that I could come up with to try to determine what's scriptural and what's not. And in fact, many of you may be listening this evening because you want me to do that. Maybe you're listening because you want to know if your divorce or your marriage is, is acceptable in the sight of God. And I've learned that those types of situations are better approached with the elders in a situation or a setting like that rather than in a public forum. But I will say this. Here are some things I've learned about this whole issue. Marriage, divorce, and maybe subsequent remarriage. Number one, it's not always black and white. You can say that it is, but until you have to practice it, until you have to approach it from an elder or preacher standpoint, you never understand that there is a deeper shade of gray sometimes. Not always. Sometimes it's black and white. Sometimes it's very easy. Sometimes you say, nope, that's wrong. But not always, for sure. Secondly, I've learned that elders are not private investigators. It's not their job to unscramble an egg. They do the best that they can with the information that they wish receive to guide a couple or a divorced individual in the paths of righteousness, lovingly teaching them and helping them along the way. But sometimes you've got to do your best and let God handle the rest, right? I've also learned that I don't believe Jesus' teaching on the subject of marriage, divorce, and remarriage in Matthew chapter 19 was meant to be a one-size-fits-all theology for all time. And I would say this. Everyone needs a place to worship. Even the most hardened sinner who has decided that he wants to turn his life around or she wants to turn her life around and she wants to get right with God, no matter what they've done in the past, if, if they are seeking to live right with God, they need a place to worship. And I say that because so many people have been hurt by Christians or leaders in the church because of divorce or remarriage situation. I've had friends that have said, I will never darken the doors of a church of Christ because of the way my parents were treated after their divorce. And that's truly sad, right? Because I think that we can teach on the sanctity of marriage without treating divorced people like lepers. I think we can do that. I think that's possible. I think you can have both those things. I think you can teach on the seriousness of covenant when it applies to marriage. I think you can talk about the sanctity of marriage in no uncertain terms and still treat people lovingly. I think you can do that. Now, in Malachi chapter 2, verse 16, God leaves no doubt as to his stance on divorce. What does he say there? I hate divorce. But do you know why? Do you know why God hates divorce? Because he loves people. That's why. And divorce fractures things. It hurts people. It causes brokenness. God may hate divorce, but he doesn't hate the people who get divorced. He loves people. And because he loves people, he doesn't want to see them hurt. And divorce always causes collateral damage. I sometimes counsel with individuals who are going through a divorce. Or maybe they're going through a separation, and I ask them, so how are the kids? And without fail, they usually say, oh, the kids are great. They're doing fine. No, they're not. They're never great. They're never doing fine. Regardless of what you think, regardless of whether they put on a facade that shows that they're doing great, they're not doing great. Divorce hurts people. And not just the two that are involved. There's collateral damage. And we have to recognize that. Now turn your attention to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, it says in verse 3 and following, Some Pharisees came to Jesus, testing him and asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason at all? 
And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. They said to him, Why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? He said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives, but from the beginning it has not been this way. And I say to you, whoever divorces his wife except for immorality and marries another woman commits adultery. The disciples said to him, if the relationship of the man with his wife is like this, it is better not to marry. But he said to them, not all men can accept this statement, but only those to whom it has been given. For there are eunuchs who were born that way from their mother's womb, and there are eunuchs who were made eunuchs by men, and there are also eunuchs who made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to accept this, let him accept it. For the sake of review, Jesus is being posed with a loaded question. It's kind of like when someone asks you, do you still beat your wife? That's a detailed answer. And they say, no, 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 yes or no. Well, that's not a yes or no answer. That is what Jesus is facing here. This is a loaded question. And you have to understand that the context of this, much like Matthew's gospel does, focuses on the Old Testament, right? You see several times Jesus reiterating what was said in the Old Testament in a different way in the New Testament, right? This is no different. The context of Matthew chapter 19 is a reference to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 24 specifically. And if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, it reads like this. When a man takes a wife and marries her, and it happens that she finds no favor in his eyes because he has found some indecency in her, and he writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out from his house, and she leaves his house and goes and becomes another man's wife, and if the latter husband turns against her and writes her a certificate of divorce and puts it in her hand and sends her out of his house, or if the latter husband dies who took her to be his wife, then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife. How often do we teach that you have to go back to your original spouse? You can't do that. That's, the law says you can't go back to your original spouse, okay? Then her former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her again to be his wife since she has been defiled, for that is an abomination before the Lord, and you shall not bring sin on the land which the Lord your God gives you as an inheritance. Now, again, looking at context, there was controversy during this time over two phrases. And the two phrases were, finds no favor in his eyes, and found some indecency in her. And there were three prominent rabbis that weighed in on this controversy. You had Rabbi Hillel, who believed that you could divorce your wife for any reason at all. And the example he used is if she burned the toast. Then you had Rabbi Shammai, who taught that divorce was allowable only in cases of immorality or adultery. He used, or focused, I should say, on that indecency part. And he saw indecency as immorality or sexual sin. And then there was Rabbi Akiba, who wrote that divorce was allowable only where immoral, or excuse me, only if you found someone better to marry. That was his reasoning. If you found someone prettier, you could divorce your current wife and go to the next one. And he focused on the finds no favor in his eyes statement. And finding no favor in your eyes meant that you didn't like her anymore. She wasn't pretty enough. So Jesus is being asked to take a side here. Are you liberal? Are you conservative? What are you? He's being backed in a corner here. Where do you fall on this subject? Because most people, the majority of people in this day and age, sided with Rabbi Hillel. Most of the people in the audience would have believed like Rabbi Hillel. You can divorce your wife if she burns the toast. And they were pretty sure Jesus didn't believe that. And so... By answering the question, the pointed question, the loaded question, he was going to alienate a large portion of the people there, which is always what they wanted. They didn't want to an answer to the question. Understand that. They didn't care what his answer was, except that, that he would incriminate himself. But notice how the wise Jesus answers the question. He takes it back 
to the very beginning. He skips over Deuteronomy chapter 24 for the moment. He goes all the way back to Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. And he, he goes back to the institution of marriage when the covenant was instituted, back when it was pure and unadulterated and before it was perverted by men like this who treated it as disposable. And Jesus reminds these experts in the law, have you not read? that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let no man separate. From the very beginning, it wasn't this way. I know that Moses allowed for divorce. The reason he allowed for divorce, by the way, is back in that day and time, and what was going on in the culture in Deuteronomy chapter 24 is that men would marry a woman, leave her to be and go find another one, leave that one, go find another one, and they had marriages all over the place. And so Moses was, in essence, saying, hey, look, divorce her so she can at least find somebody else. But as it is, she had no means to support herself. She was totally reliant on her husband, and he had left her. He had put her away, is the terminology. And so... Moses said, at least divorce her so she can go and marry somebody else and be taken care of. That's the context, okay? And so now, Jesus takes it back to the very beginning and says, look, before this whole perversion happened, it was always intended to be one man, one woman for life. That was the intention. He says, therefore, they asked Jesus, why then did Moses command to give her a certificate of divorce and send her away? Jesus doesn't deny that. He doesn't deny that Moses uh, allowed divorce, but he does tell them that the reason was because of the hardness of men's hearts. Notice that Jesus concludes that statement with a reaffirmation of his previous point. He states, but from the beginning, it has not been this way. In other words, the intent was pure. It was good that the covenant of marriage was intended to last. And I think the overwhelming point from Matthew chapter 19 that we need to take away is that marriage should not have an exit strategy. You don't go into marriage with divorce on the table and say, well, if it doesn't work out, we can always get divorced. You see, we zero in on Matthew 19 and we try to use it for a one-size-fits-all theology for marriage, divorce, and remarriage. And while it does have instruction there for us concerning that topic, the bigger issue and what Jesus is approaching is the question, the loaded question. And he's saying, it wasn't supposed, it wasn't supposed to be this way. Now, like I said earlier, what's ideal and what's real are often two different things. Because throughout the Bible, you read about what is ideal and what is real. I mean, people sin, right? And people get divorced. So what God has joined together, let no man separate, it would be great if that never happened. But it does, doesn't it? Unfortunately, it does. And, and for some people, it is no fault of their own. They, they didn't imagine being divorced and raising kids on their own or having to split time with step-parents and all that. They didn't ask for that. They didn't want that. They have been put away. But even for the one who comes into the church, maybe comes to Christianity later who has been divorced, don't they need some place to worship? Don't they need someone to guide them in the paths of righteousness? And I say all that because I, I, I've seen too many people hurt, thankfully not by this church, but by the church at large because they came wanting to find peace wanting to find someone to help them, to guide them, and they instead were treated almost like lepers. I don't think the church has always handled this issue with grace and love and mercy like they should. I mean, people are already hurting, and I think that we can be both convicted and compassionate. Like I said, there, there are certain... Listen, I have, I have encountered certain marital situations that would blow your mind. I've encountered certain scenarios as well as our elders that you wonder, where in the world do we go with this one, right? Especially in the foreign mission field. I mean, you find situations that are just absolutely disheartening, but, you know, in order to, to kind of call those out and figure out what's going on there and how to guide them in the right direction, I mean, it's all fine in theory, but when you put it into practice, it's difficult. Here's what I think needs to happen in our churches in order to help the divorced heal. 
we got to preach the truth in love, always, with anything. You know, some marital situations are difficult to discern. They just are. Some aren't. If I ran off with another woman tomorrow, I would expect you to be black and white about that because that's wrong. Nothing right about that. You don't solve marital problems by bringing in a third party to have sex with. You don't solve marital problems by turning to another man's wife or another woman's husband. God is not going to send you someone else's spouse to be your soulmate. That's not how this works. So we have to recognize that some of these situations are pretty cut and dry. But not all of them. Some of them are difficult to discern. But always, we preach the truth in love. An exceptional measure of grace and mercy. Secondly, we must let the divorce know that they're not alone. It's hard to be single in the church. It's hard to be single in life. It's hard to be single in the church, especially if you're raising children. Virtually every church, as we've said before, has a gap or a hole for single people. And it's hard for single people to find their place in church. Imagine how much more difficult that would be if you were someone who was looking around and seeing happy married couples and you're thinking to yourself, that, that used to be me, and that should be me, but for whatever reason, it's not. So many times, I think the church takes a guilty until proven innocent approach when it comes to divorce, or marriage and divorce, and it's unfortunate. An extra measure of grace and mercy sometimes is what needs to happen. When people feel the most alone in life, they need us. Imagine that first night, that very first night, that a man or a woman must sleep alone after being married. How do you think they must feel going to bed alone for the first time? Christians should be the first people to come to their aid, not the last. And finally, we must give them hope. Because I think an important message that divorced folks need to hear is that although God hates divorce, he doesn't hate people. He loves people. And there is recovery from divorce. There is a future after being divorced. We need to help folks connect with that hope, and we need to help them focus on the most important relationship, which is a relationship with God. A spouse may desert us, a spouse may leave us or forsake us, but not God. Hope is found in getting closer to God and fostering that relationship above all else. And and using wise discernment and understanding that, you know, we don't know all the ins and outs. Our shepherds might, but we don't. We don't always know. So quit making a judgment on the front end when we don't know the whole story. And there's a couple of extremes here, isn't there? And we've got to not operate in the extremes. And I say that all the time because it happens all the time. One extreme is there's absolutely no reason for divorce. Another extreme is that there is only one reason for divorce, and that is, that is adultery. Or, you know, and, and so we wonder about, okay, so we encourage folks to stay in a marriage where they're getting the tar beat out of them. Because you can't get divorced. They're not being unfaithful to you sexually. They're just beating the snot out of you. So you've got to stay in that. And then we have questions like, what about pornography and those kind of things, Right? And so we have that, and and then we have the other side where our culture treats divorce like it's nothing. It's capricious. It's just, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'll just get divorced. I'll move on to the next one. That's not what God had in mind either. Don't operate in the extreme. Stay out of the ditches, right? You know, a French teacher was discussing with her students the use of gender in the French language. And she explained that all French nouns are either masculine or feminine. And so one of the students said, well, what about, say, computer? Is that masculine or feminine? Well, this particular French teacher didn't have a good answer for that. And so she divided the kids up. She divided the classroom in boys and girls, which when I was teaching school, they told you never to do. But she divided them into boys and girls. And she said, come up with a reason why the computer should be masculine or feminine. Here's what the boys came up with. The male group decided that computers should be feminine because, number one, no one but their creator can understand their internal logic. Number two, 
The native language they use to communicate with other computers is incomprehensible to almost everyone else. Number three, even the smallest mistakes are stored in long-term memory for possible retrieval later. And number four, as soon as you make a commitment to one, you find yourself spending half your paycheck on accessories for it. Now, the female group decided that computers should be masculine because number one, they have a lot of data, but they are clueless. Number two, they are supposed to help you solve problems, but half the time they are the problem. And number three, as soon as you commit to one, you realize that if you had waited a little longer, you could have gotten a better one. While that illustration may be funny, it may be tongue-in-cheek, it illuminates the reality that men and women are different. And it's those differences that often lead to divorce, isn't it? It's often the differences that lead to a couple engaging in divorce. But here's the thing. The one thing that God saw that was not good at the end of his creation was that man was alone. Woman was created to fill this void. She was the missing piece of the puzzle. She was shaped physically, emotionally, psychologically, and, 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 and spiritually to fit nice and neat in the void beside man. And the very purpose of the woman's creation demanded that she be different. It's the differences that often lead to problems and to divorce. Of course, when we handle those differences, or how we handle those differences is key. When we handle them with selfishness or pride, those are usually precursors to divorce. I would say this, no divorce has ever occurred without selfishness, either on one or both parties' part. So when it comes to how we handle these problems, it is paramount that we seek to be proactive, that we focus on God's plan for marriage. However, an unfortunate reality is that we will always be reactive as well, won't we? I think the church here at Oldham Lane has striven to be proactive when it comes to families and what it means to be uh, in the covenant of marriage and what that covenant looks like. I know for myself, I will not perform a wedding unless the couple go through premarital counseling, either with me or with uh, someone who can give them good premarital counseling. I want to do my part to try to set them up, not for the wedding day, but the, for the marriage that is to follow, right? But no matter how proactive we are, we will always have to be reactive, unfortunately. Because marriages dissolve. People get divorced. But how we react also will make a huge difference in how the person deals with divorce and how they heal and continue to heal going forward. And that's important. Because look, folks, I've said it before. I've got some pretty staunch convictions on some things, and I believe the Bible teaches certain things, and I, and I buy in wholeheartedly. I've told you there are some things that today I believe it this way, but I reserve the right to change my mind tomorrow. I've also said that there are some things that I believe, and that uh, if we stop doing them, or if somebody else is doing them more right tomorrow, I'll be there because I want to be right with God. But there are some things that are just hard to discern. There are some marital situations that are just hard to discern. But I'll tell you what I do. When it comes to those things, I err on the side of love. And you say, well, that's a cop-out. No, it's not, because God is love, and the most important virtue is love. So if I'm struggling, if I'm having a hard time, I ask for wisdom, I pray to God, but I also show love. Because if I'm going to be wrong on something, it's going to be on the side of love, not hate or condemnation. Because I've learned this in 17 years of ministry. You slam a door, it's very hard to get it opened again. And especially on this issue, if you don't handle it correctly, they'll go down the road to another church that doesn't care. They don't care what your situation was. It's all okay. And that's not good either. So, I appreciate you listening today. I appreciate you being here. If you're going through a particular transition in your life, if you're feeling alone, if you're struggling in your marriage, if we can help you with that, you don't have to walk down the aisle and come forward this evening. Talk to me, talk to one of the elders afterwards. If you're someone who has 
contemplating marriage, you want to know more about this topic, then let, surely let us help you. We want to be proactive in helping set you on the right path in understanding the covenant of marriage. Maybe you're someone tonight that wants to start with a relationship with God, then certainly that is the best place to start, and we want to help you with that. Mike's going to lead us in a song. If we can help you tonight, please let us know. Come as we stand and as we sing.